from WBZ News Radio in Boston is my friend Adam Kaufman. Kauf, good morning. Well, first, I just want to say I appreciate you having me on right before Kevin Harvick. It makes a lot of sense since I know we're just going to go in circles for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> That's good. That's excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's, it's early. I just got up, but this is perfect. Uh, look, man, I mean, for people that don't know, maybe you've talked about this. We have a text chain. Us, you know, a couple other buddies, and and this has been a, a real talking point for the – the better part of a few days, obviously. And you guys just going back and forth to the point where, like you said, like, yeah, I, I don't want to have to be that guy that poo-poos Julian Edelman's career to, you know, condemn things that he achieved just because of what he didn't achieve. But others don't even hesitate. Like, one of the guys on our tech chain sent out an article this morning that's headlined on Twitter, you know, I look at a total of 15 wide receivers with great pro football Hall of Fame credentials, none of whom retired in the last four days. People are just getting snarky on the Julian Edelman thing, the poor guy. Whereas he has, it's not like he's ever talked about the Hall of Fame. And all I can do is look at these tweets and look, and look at these these texts coming through and just sound like you know the dude in the Big Lebowski and just go, <laughs> well, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I just don't think it's as laughable as everybody else does. You will because you said tweets live in infamy. You will notice. And I know that your program in particular takes my tweets as gospel. So let's remember <laughs> what I wrote. Let's remember what I wrote, D.A. I didn't say Julian Edelman is a Hall of Famer or Julian Edelman, you know, when when he's eligible in a handful of years, just you wait, he's going to hear his name called. No, I said I feel he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Now, it may take 20 or 30 years for him to get there. You know, it's, it's when he's eligible in 2025 for the Patriots Hall of Fame to get his red jacket, sure, probably going to hear his name called, if not that year, the next year. Canton, the gold jacket? No, 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 no. I know that if that ever happens, it's going to take a long time. I just don't think it's just this clear-cut, no-brainer, absolutely, he does not belong, because I think that you can make a case. You can make a case. Would he get in before Tory Holt or Reggie Wayne or, you know, everyone likes to highlight Heinz Ward? No, I, I don't think he would. I'm not even saying he should. I'm saying those guys don't matter in, in my mind. Like, they all belong in the Hall of Fame as far as I'm concerned, and they could get there. And Julian Edelman could get there. And I could run down a whole bunch of different numbers and reasons why, and I'm happy to do it, but I'm sure you have a question. Well, I guess my question, my first question would be, because I'm not here just to badger you on this point, because I just frankly think that there is not a reality to to saying he can get into the Hall of Fame. I don't think he'll ever have a resume. It'll only get diminished in time as more wide receivers stack up with better numbers, where 80% of the voters will vote in a guy that never made a Pro Bowl. I just don't think there's ever going to be a reality that we exist in where in the future... 80% of the voters say that guy was a Hall of Famer. So I don't even really think it's a debate. I don't think it's ever a reality. So I guess my first question would be, do you honestly think in our lifetime we'll see it, or you just believe in your heart that he's a Hall of Famer? I would say it's a little of column A, a little of column B. I, you know, obviously, like, would I bet my mortgage that he's going to be a Hall of Famer? I mean, that probably wouldn't be a good fiscal investment. <laughs> but do I think that he belongs there? Yes. Do I think that he will one day get there? And when I say one day, like, you know, we're going to be old and gray and talking about the good times, Syracuse living at the varsity? Like, yeah, I mean, maybe, but it's going to be that long it's, it's you know this isn't we're not talking about tom brady we're not talking about bill belichick we're not talking about rob gronkowski but we are talking about a guy again who has a case okay we remember obviously the super bowl mvp against the rams which i heard some i think it was mike florio say like he basically won by default no he was dominant in that game running all around the field making plays putting them in position to win that game in a game where otherwise they're really wasn't any offense. He made, as we know, the catch against the Falcons in what was the biggest comeback in Super Bowl history and certainly the greatest catch in Super Bowl history. And oh, a little bit of okay, let's back off on the greatest catch. 
There, Lynn Fine. Swan one had up. a couple one of great up. catches, one and up. Tyree had the catch. It's one of the great catches. Fine, yes. one of I, I, for all for all the squabbling and uh, and and you know nitpicking that I'm sure we'll do. We don't need to spend the entire time on that. One of touchdown pass against Baltimore, as we know, to Danny Amendola, which helped that 2014 run, 2015 playoffs. The game-winning touchdown in the Super Bowl against Seattle. So there are a lot of moments, okay? There are a lot of moments that plenty of guys, some Hall of Famers or others with Hall of Fame cases who absolutely have more impressive regular season numbers, they don't have these moments. Now, for people that just, you know, I, I don't know why, I don't know why in general, this is not a Julian Edelman thing, this is an in general thing. I don't know when it is that we started just undervaluing the postseason and caring more about fantasy stats in general. You know, in the case of Julian Edelman, as we know, and I'm sure you've highlighted it, second all time, second all time to Jerry Rice in playoff catches and playoff yards. If you want to talk about regular season, or I should add to that on top of that, Michael Irvin, he is tied with Michael Irvin, a Hall of Famer, by the way, with the most 100-yard playoff games, six. He is third in yards in Super, in, in Super Bowl games all time. Now, as far as regular season goes, and he was only a full-time wide receiver for six years. Okay, so, Koff, I, 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 I want to tighten this up because I want to yeah. get to the parts that you and I agree on so we don't have to keep going over this. Fine. He was an elite playoff receiver. Okay. And a mediocre regular season receiver. He had many, many wonderful January and February moments, and those are absolutely his highlights. My art, my my question would be: What is the historical precedent to a player that was so mediocre in the regular season and had such a wonderful playoff career that he gets into a Hall of Fame? And I will ask this about any sports Hall of Fame: baseball, football, basketball, hockey. Who was just a pure playoff guy that got into the Hall of Fame on that? I would say if, if there are any good comps, and I'll, I'll credit my guy Adam Rank over at NFL Network, who has been, because he is a Julian Edelman's a Hall of Famer proponent, and he has been spouting out some names. Your closest comps, if you were to make any, would be Michael Irvin to some degree, uh, but then maybe more so Lynn Swan, who did not have very good stats. You know, he never had a, a thousand yards. He, you know, he, he had some playoff success, not nearly to the degree of Julian Edelman, but of course he gets credited for kind of transcending the position. And so obviously he got in there at a, a time when, I'm not going to say it was ever easy to get in Canton, but it was maybe less complicated than it is now. Fred uh, Blitnikoff is another guy that you could use as a comp. Those are a few justifiable comps in the case of Julian Edelman. What I will add to that, too, though, even looking beyond comps, is let us remember, and you pointed this out earlier with the 80% needed, it is subjective. This whole thing, Hall of Fames in general, Canton or otherwise, are so incredibly subjective to where, you know, some people, and we've seen it, articles have been written, you know, it's another thing we were looking at in our text chain yesterday. Articles have been written where some are going to look at Julian Edelman and talk about him in the way that Bill Belichick always has. You know, this undeniable winner and competitor and, you know, what he grew from, as you said, converted quarterback and seventh rounder and punt returner and special teamer and, and you know, at times a defensive back to, you know, all that he went on to achieve where, and, you know, you say that like he had these mediocre regular season stats. Well, sure, collectively on the whole compared to, Again, a Heinz Ward and, and some of the guys that are already there. But there was a six-year period of time, like I was starting to say earlier, where he averaged seven catches a game, which was fourth in the NFL during that time. He was not mediocre. He had a window. Maybe it was too small a window in the eyes of some, and I get it. But he had a window oh, where he that was window in, involved no. It involved no Pro Bowl, so he was neither the fourth through the sixth best wide receiver in his conference. How can Look, man, you say that that was I, a great truly, window? The all the like not being an All Pro thing, I get it. Like I didn't look at Julian Edelman and think All Pro either. The fact that he never made a Pro Bowl, honestly, I don't even really understand. I mean, they give those things out like candy. I don't get how he never made a because Pro he Bowl, was so never I, one of the four best wide receivers on his, in his conference. That's why. Yeah, I just, I, again, I, I think we're, maybe he got overshadowed at, at certain by points. By what? <laughs> well, by, I mean. By what? I he mean, played in the, all of the big the, games. The he played in his own team at points. I mean, obviously, like, you know, it, he was, 
is he didn't not play with Randy Moss. From Rob Gronkowski's numbers because obviously they were elite. But I mean, at times, like he was responsible for getting them down the field, and then Gronkowski would get the touchdown. You know, there are so for people that want to you know highlight the 36 career touchdowns, like I get it. You know, he was never a uh, a, a dominant touchdown scorer. I mean, not in a single season. It's it's like I said at the beginning. We can sit here and 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 I can understand. Every single I've, like I've read the articles, or I, I just I have my own intuition. Like I, I can understand all the different cases against Julian Edelman being a pro, a pro football Hall of Famer. I can. Uh, he doesn't have this slam dunk case, but I do think a m- my whole thing with the tweet in this conversation is I think a case could be made that is is not ridiculous. That's but all. Ever, that I guess get in ever, one my, day. my point is though, and you're my friend, so I this is. None of this is obviously in, in bad will or anything. I, I respect sure. your opinion, et cetera. I just can't find a path to get into the Hall of Fame for him. That's my problem with the argument. It's not a fair comp to put it with Michael Irvin. Michael Irvin was an all-decade team, so he is one of the four best wide receivers of his decade. Okay, He also made five Pro Bowls. That is not a comp. Lynn Swan was an all-decade team in the 1970s, a three-time Pro Bowler. That's not a comp. He's one of the four best wide receivers of his decade. Fred Bolitnikoff was a four-time Pro Bowler, and you might want to make the argument he was not an all-decade team guy. Four Pro Bowls versus zero, not necessarily dominant. That's fine, but Bolitnikoff, Bolitnikoff doesn't get into the Hall of Fame based on just postseason stats. He gets into the Hall of Fame because in the 70s, there really isn't a great passing league. And so the little that you did had to be weighed against it. Now, Edelman plays in the most explosive offensive passing era ever, doesn't make one Pro Bowl, certainly doesn't make an all-decade team, and there's 250 players above him in NFL history that have caught more passes. If you want to say he's an elite postseason player, no doubt about it. But the people that say, well, then why would you put in Eli? He, he gets in based on pure postseasons Eli retired as a top 10 passer in attempts completions yards and touchdowns his regular seasons put him historically in the top 10 he'll get passed because it's a passing era but the same thing with Edelman by the time he comes up there's gonna be another 50 guys that have caught more passes there is no path to putting Edelman in the Hall of Fame because there is no historical precedent to having such an unimpactful regular season career and that being enough to get you into Canton. I think the only path that he has, the only path, again, it's not regular season to your point. We all know that. It's, it's not regular season. The only path that he has are those signature moments, the, as you said, elite postseason play regarded for, you know, all that he accomplished there and the three Super Bowl wins and Super Bowl MVP and, and on and on and on with the, the ranking next to Jerry Rice. And that's going to be something that, you know, it's, it's going to be a while, you know, if ever, that somebody does come across those numbers. And maybe in this passing era that, that does happen. You know, maybe he gets passed in that conversation as well in time. But if, if he does have any path, it's people looking back and remembering again and, and putting more emphasis than historically has been done on the clutch play, on those moments, and also being, if not, it's debatable, but being the best receiver, quite frankly, in Patriots history, and if not the best, certainly the most important and during the most significant era, the most significant dynasty, arguably anyway, in NFL history. That is, that is his path. Now, it, it depends because, again, it is subjective. Like, there isn't this – it's like baseball and the character clause. Like, there's, you know, how those voters or, or an eventual competition committee down the line, how all these people who are not you and me are going to look at this from within down the line, we don't know. I mean, is, is the, are, are the odds greater that you're right than I'm right? Of course. Like, I'm not an idiot, but I do think – the potential is there, the cases to be made. I mean, there's really not much more I can say about it. Like, I can't invent numbers that aren't there. I can't tell you he was on the, you know, he wasn't an all-pro, he wasn't a pro bowler, he wasn't an all-decade team, but have you heard about? No, like, that category isn't there, other than, again, clutch play evidence and, and some of those, you know, intangibles that sometimes get, 
you know, overvalued by some in sports and laughed at by others in sports. And it's going to play out however it plays out. And at that point in time, you're probably going to be long off the radio, and I'm going to be, you know, playing professional mini golf, and, like, that's what we're going to be doing for a living. You know what I mean? Like, we just don't know. It's going to take time. I also wonder if he might not be hurt because of the steroid thing. He did get suspended and tested positive for PEDs. It's a ding. For For sure it's a ding. That four gamer is a ding. And then also... It could go one of two ways, but there's going to be a lot of Patriots that get into the Hall of Fame because of this 20 years of success in 5, 10, 15 years. That might also hurt him because you've got to put in, you know, five other guys above him that that are absolutely deserving. So there could be a bit of a Patriots fatigue. Let's move on from that because I got one more question for you before we got to wrap up. The last time we had you on, you said you hated watching the Celtics team, and now they've ripped off 7 of 10 in the last four in inspirational fashion a couple of times. Do you still hate the Celtics because they're going to rope you in and then kill you in the playoffs? So it's it's honestly with the Celtics team, it's and, and for any Celtics team, for any team that I enjoy watching, the, the rope me in factor as a sports fan, like it's real, but it's it's not the end all be all. The end all be all is just being an enjoyable team to watch and hopefully obviously there's there's a ceiling and there's been a lot of success here in the last couple of decades in Boston with that ceiling as we know. With the Celtics, they are much more enjoyable to watch right now, but it's 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 not because all of a sudden, like, I think they're good. They've flipped this switch. That's not what it is. It's that now they're out there. One, the give a bleep meter that we always talk about, the compete level, if you will, is actually, you know, closer to a 10 than a 2. And on top of that, they're, it's just the way they're doing certain things. Like Jason Tatum, we've always known, you know, he's an all-star. He is a budding superstar. Some would say he's already a superstar. The potential is through the roof, you know, for him and for Jalen Brown. But it's the little things that haven't been there, specifically with Jason Tatum getting to the line, you know, actually like drawing contact and not just living in isolation play. These, the growth within his game that we're starting to see, and, and he's young. He's He's very young. He's 23 years old. But some of these aspects of growth that, you know, where you get frustrated as you sit and watch and you say, man, I mean, just stop, like, living from 20 feet away or around the key or going in for a dunk when you have a lane. Like, draw contact. Go to the free throw line, you know, 6, 8, 10, 12 times in a game. And, you know, never mind what that's going to do for you statistically. It just changes the offense. It makes it you know, a, a, um, a more entertaining brand of basketball. And, and part of that comes back to just what you think of, of this day and age we live in, in the NBA with three-point shooting in general. But, to, you know, to easily answer your question, it's a more fun team to watch, but it's trying harder, it's competing better, and, uh, and, and it's showing people a little bit closer to, again, playing to its talent level and showing what they're capable of come to playoffs. I still don't think they're a contender. I still don't think they're going to win a championship. But if everything broke right, could they get to the, you know, to the conference finals? Sure. Are they probably going to bow out in round two? Probably. But if they keep playing like this the rest of the way versus what we saw the first half plus of the season, it's, it's just a totally different attitude. Yeah, I'm aligned with you on that. I think you're right about that. It's a different attitude. Potential's a little greater. Probably flames out in the second round. At best, something breaks their way in the conference finals. Maybe they get there. They're not going to win a championship, but I agree with you on the last couple of weeks of Celtics basketball. Adam Kaufman.